This video is going to be an introduction to truth table rules. Construction of truth tables is one of the basic skills that you get in a logic class like proofs and symbolization. Most people find truth tables easier than proofs or symbolization, and most textbooks actually start with truth tables. I like to introduce them later in the semester because I think at this point they're more meaningful to us than they would be at the beginning of the semester. Here I have a table. I have listed all five of our connectives and associated them with the P's and Q's which stand in for all of the possible uppercase letters. Um, let me put P and Q over here and point out that what we're going to do on this table is explain each one of our connectives as a rule that operates on the values that P and Q could have. Every sentence letter can have one of two values. It could be true or it could be false. Let's say P is the sentence Janet likes Jello. Well, that could be a true sentence. It could be a false sentence. But what if you've got two sentence letters? Uh, one standing for Janet likes Jello, the other one stands for Brenda likes malt liquor. Well, they could both be true, or it could be that one is false and the other is true. And of course, we could reverse them, true and false, or possibly they're both false. If you have two sentence letters, then you have got four combinations of possible truth values, both true, both false, or some combination in between. And each one of our connectives is a rule for how to operate on these underlying truth values. Just like the plus sign and the mi minus sign are mathematic are symbols in mathematics that operate on numerical values, the symbols in logic operate on truth values. The ampersand is incredibly simple and very intuitive. Let's say that P stands for um, Janet likes Jello and Brenda likes malt liquor. Well, if it's true that Janet likes Jello and it's true that Brenda likes malt liquor then the conjunction of those two simple sentences is obviously true as well. In fact, we've pointed out that a good way to think about the meaning of ampersand intuitively is that it says both parts of me are true. Well, what if it's false that Janet likes Jello, but it's true that Brenda likes malt liquor? If I say the sentence, Janet likes Jello and Brenda likes malt liquor, well, then I'm lying because one part of what I just said was false. Therefore, the whole thing is false. Well, what if it's true that Janet likes Jello, but it's false that Brenda likes malt liquor? What's going to be the combination of the two in a conjunction? False. And what if they're both false? Janet doesn't like Jello, Brenda doesn't like malt liquor, so the combination itself, also false. This just is what the ampersand is. It's a, it's a rule that says, if you give me two true sentences, I'll give you a true output. If you give me any other combination, I'll give you a false output. Well, the OR is just as intuitive as long as we remember that the wedge is inclusive. And so what it means is that at least one part of me is true. So if both parts are true, it's really true that Janet likes Jello. it's really true that Brenda likes malt liquor, then if you say, Either Janet likes Jello or Brenda likes malt liquor, that's going to be true because the wedge is inclusive. And if at least one part is true, the whole thing is going to be true. Of course, if they're both false, then the entire sentence will be false. Notice this nice symmetry between the ampersand and the wedge. With the ampersand, it's only true if they're both true, and with the wedge, it's only false if they're both false. The arrow is weird. In fact, logicians have been concerned about the arrow ever since uh, people were thinking about symbolic logic. Let's skip it for a moment and turn our attention to the tilde and work our way back. When you're talking about the tilde, the tilde is only applying to a single value at a time. All the rest of our connectives are combining values in a way, but the tilde is only applying to a single element. So the convention here is 
we're applying the tilde to P, notice we really only need to think about, that's not what I meant to do, put that back. Um, we really only need to think about the two cases here where P could be true, could be false. When P is true, what's going to be the value of tilde P? Obviously false, right? But if P is false, then tilde P will be true. The tilde just reverses the truth value. Very intuitive. The typical convention is, since under P here we had true, false, true, false, well then under t tilde P we'll have false, true, false, true, because we're reversing the entire column. I just used the word columns. I should pause for a moment and point out that rows go across, columns go up and down. If you've never seen this before, let me do it here. Rows, columns. Columns are like ancient Greek columns. They go up and down. Uh, so anyway, rows and columns. Uh, they use the same tech, uh, same terminology any place you find rows and columns, like for instance in an Excel spreadsheet. Okay, uh, back to the table. The tilde is simple. Let's talk about the arrow. No, I'm sorry, let's talk about the double arrow and then we'll talk about the arrow. The double arrow has all of the unintuitive properties of the arrow, but as long as we don't overthink it, we can, we can ignore them and let's just get the rule out and then we'll talk about the weirdness over here. I've said that intuitively a good way to think about the double arrow is as a correlation between the parts. The correlation that's actually important is the correlation between the truth values. And so if both of the parts are true, then the double arrow itself is going to be true because the parts are correlated. If the parts are different, then the double arrow is going to be false. And if they're both false though, once again, the values are correlated, and so the double arrow itself is going to be true. Now, if you think about this in terms of actual sentences, your intuitions are going to balk. But in terms of doing a table, all we're going to do is look at the truth values, and basically it's this simple. If the values are the same, the double arrow is true. If the values are different, the double arrow is false. Let's talk about the arrow. Okay, so as I say, the arrow is weird. It has got at least two different things going on with it that make it odd. Uh, but let's start with some fairly intuitive examples. Let's not do that. Okay, getting everything. This is all so fiddly to get my tools to work here. Let's start with the case where the antecedent is true. That's, yeah, okay. These two cases right here. True arrow true and true arrow false. And let's take an example of a sentence that's of the first form. If you're watching this video, then you're learning about truth tables. Well, it is true that you're watching this video. Correct? Yes, correct. It is also true that you're learning about truth tables. At least, presumably that's true. So if you're watching this video, then you're learning about truth tables. That's a true arrow true. Intuitively, is this conditional itself a true sentence? I hope you're saying yes. If you're watching this video, then you're learning about truth tables. That itself is a true statement. But now let's look at true arrow false. So get rid of this example and bring up the other one. If you're watching this video, then you're learning how to paint. Well, that it's true that you're watching the video. But it is false that you're learning how to paint. Uh, if anything, you're learning how not to paint. You're not learning that either. But uh, this is clearly an instance of a true or a false sentence and its value is false. 
I hope that that felt fairly intuitive. But notice that all we're caring about is the truth values of the sentences. So let me give you another example that will call that will bring attention to the peculiarity about this. If you're watching this video, then bears have fur. Well, notice it's true. Why is that not working? It is true that you're watching this video. It's also true that bears have fur. Is this sentence a true sentence? If you're watching this video, then bears have fur. I suspect if I announced this in class one day, you would look at me with a great perplexity and saying, I, I don't think my instructor understands very much about bears. Um, but in fact, just in terms of the way that the truth table interpretation of if then works, this is a true sentence. Why is it that our intuitions balk at this? Well, when you say an if then sentence in English, most of the time the if then expresses some sort of essential connection between the antecedent and the consequent. Typically, it implies some sort of a causal connection. When I, if I was just to say this in conversation, it would sound like what I was saying is that the fact that I'm watching the video is causing bears to have fur, and that's clearly a mistake. But as we've pointed out a couple of times, if then actually doesn't have anything to do with causation. The arrow itself is just another rule about how to combine truth values. In fact, if you said, let's not make this an if-then sentence, let's just make it an and sentence. You're watching this video and bears have fur. Well, when it's an and sentence, it doesn't bother us so much that these two sub-sentences don't have any connection between each other. But when you say an arrow, it really does imply some sort of meaningful connection between antecedent and consequent. But that's part of the meaning level that we're stripping away when we symbolize formulas and reduce them merely to their structure. The logical structure that we are worried about in this class is just about the truth value relationships. It has nothing to do with the meaningful connection between the parts. This has bothered logicians a great deal. I mean, it seems like the meaningful connected connections ought to be important. Why are they not important? Um, and why doesn't this bother us more when we're using logic to symbolize the arguments that we worry about? I think part of the reason that it doesn't create a bigger problem is because people don't say sentences like this very often at all. In practice, when we're sort of dealing with things that people actually say and the arguments that they make when we symbolize them, we don't have to deal with weirdness like this because uh, people say sentences that have meaningful connections. But the truth is, stuff gets worse. Let's clean up a little bit and let's uh, point out that there are two more cases that we haven't even dealt with yet. So the first problem about the arrow is that there's no meaningful connection implied in English if that the arrow doesn't capture the meaningful connection that is implied when we say if then sentences. Now, let us look at an F arrow T sentence. Here's one right here. If you're riding a horse, then bears have fur. Well, what we have here is an instance of a sentence that has a true antecedent, I'm sorry, a false antecedent, I presume that you are not riding a horse right now, and a true consequent. If you're riding a horse, then bears have fur. Intuitively, is this sentence true or false? My own assessment of this is that this is nonsense. If you're, if you're riding a horse, yeah, but I'm not riding a horse. But if you're riding a horse, then bears have fur. I think that our minds sort of balk 
at even interpreting this. We kind of want to say, this, this doesn't make sense. What, what are you even saying? Um, what do you suppose logicians are going to say about it? Logicians are going to say that this is true. In fact, we have mentioned this before in passing in constructing proofs, and I have pointed out that when the consequent of a conditional is true, the entire conditional itself has got to be true. And so you could say, the reason that this sentence is true is because the consequent is true. And our intuitions can hear this uh, if it's presented in a certain way. Um, true or false, bears have fur. It's true. Well, so if you're watching a video right now, then bears have fur? Yes, because bears have fur. If you're riding a horse right now, then bears have fur? Yes, because bears have fur. If whatever you want to say, then bears have fur, is going to be true because it's true, because the consequent itself is true. All right, well, there's one more case to consider here. Let's consider an example of a false or a false. So here is a sentence that has a false antecedent. If you're riding a horse and you are not, then bears can fly and they can't. Is this sentence true or false? Now some of you are thinking, oh, well, I get it. So if the consequent is true, it's true. So if the, if, if the consequent is false, then it's false. But in fact, this sentence is also true. If you're riding a horse, then bears can fly. And in fact, logicians say there are two ways to make conditionals true. You can make the consequent true, or you can make the antecedent false. And in this case, what we're saying is, look, you're basically starting with nonsense because it's the opposite of what is the case. So if you're riding a horse and you're not, well, since this is nonsense, then you can say anything you want for the consequence. It's a good way to think about it is garbage in, garbage out. It is just like, it is very closely related to the contradiction shortcut that we've talked about in proofs. You're starting with a contradiction to the truth. And from a contradiction, anything follows. In, in conversation, we almost have a prohibition against saying sentences where you intend the listener to hear the antecedent is false. We just don't say sentences of this form hardly ever. Um, now, we do say things like, well, if Hillary Clinton had won the election in 2016, then da 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 da, and that sounds like a false arrow, that, that sounds like a sentence that has a false antecedent. But when we say sentences like that, we don't want the listener to imagine that the antecedent is false. We actually want them to imagine a different world in which the antecedent is actually true. It is very rare where we want the listener to imagine a world where the antecedent is actually false. Now, there are some fun uh, cases where we do this basically for sarcastic humor. Uh, we tend to use phrases like pigs can fly and when hell freezes over to indicate uh, such cases. So you might say something like, uh, I will take logic too when hell freezes over. Um, that would be basically saying, if hell freezes over, then I'll take logic too. And so we say things like that and we have these pat phrases that everybody understands is false uh, and so logicians like such cases because they sort of show that there is some part of our intuitions that really understands this logic. You know, we're kind of making a, a joke based on, on logic. Truth is, I have no examples at all of a false hero true. Uh, it seems to me that we never say that, but we do occasionally say false hero false for this sarcastic humor. Um, so... Two problems with the arrow. One is that the arrow does not capture the meaningful connection that we usually associate with if then in English. And two, we virtually never say 
conditionals where we intend the listener to understand the antecedent is false, we tend to identify these things as nonsense. I think these are both really significant issues. Uh, they say an awful lot about the relationship between humans and the, the system of logic itself. But it's the type of thing which you could spend an entire semester studying. Uh, you can, you, and literally, you can take a course that is basically are, are problems with the, with the material conditional and, and trying to understand what it means. The good news is that for the purposes of actually using the truth table rules and constructing truth tables, you can ignore those problems. I like to say that this table is the entirety of the system of logic laid bare in its simplest possible form. What we also have here is a set of rules that we can use for various purposes over the next couple of weeks. You could memorize this entire table and memorize all the T's and F's and how they're related to the connectives or you could memorize a rule associated with each of these. For the ampersand, the rule is basically true output if and only if both of the inputs are true. So you get a true output if they're both true, you get false in every other case. For the wedge, the rule is true if at least one input is true. This is a little messier than I intended, but there we go. Uh, you get a true output if at least one of the inputs is true. Um, then for the arrow, I kind of cheat here, and I say true output if and only if, or actually true output except in the TROF case. Notice the only way to make an arrow false is to have the antecedent is true and the consequent false. Every other case is true. For the double arrow, that's the easiest one of all. It's true if and only if the inputs are the same. And, well, I guess the easiest one of all is the tilde. Opposite value. These are the five rules that you need to know to construct tables. And I, uh, what you want to do is go to page 4.1 in the course packet, and there are some tables that are set up and ready to be built. Uh, I suppose actually you want to watch the other introductory video, which shows how to use these rules to construct some basic tables, and then you want to go to 4.1 and do some actual construction. Thank you.